As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and I am inside the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is actually inside the tomb itself. This is where Jesus' body lay. And on the third day, the power of God literally erupted inside this tomb. The power of God entered into the body of Jesus. Death was driven from him. And Jesus rose from the dead. It happened right in this very room. Most people are not allowed to come here with a camera. So this is quite remarkable that I'm able to show you. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a hoax. This tomb is empty because God raised Jesus from the dead. On the day of the resurrection, the angels announced, Behold, he's not here. He is risen. And he's still risen today. He's living. He's praying. He's interceding for you. And he's available to let the same resurrection power that raised him from the dead work in you. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. In today's introduction, I was actually standing inside the tomb at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's amazing to me because cameras are not allowed there. But the man who is in charge of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre invited me to come with the cameras right inside the tomb. That is the place where Jesus was buried and where he was resurrected. And the tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. Now, somebody has asked me, Rick, why do you believe that was the real location? Some people have even said, there's another location in Jerusalem called the Garden Tomb that's very pretty, it's very enjoyable, and I agree with you, it's very pretty. The Garden Tomb is beautiful, but history verifies the other location is the real place where Jesus was buried and was raised from the dead. And in fact, a church was built on that site as early as the year 326. That's very, very early to commemorate the fact that that was the location where Jesus was buried and was raised from the dead. We know that when the Emperor Hadrian came to power, he despised everything Jewish and everything Christian and tried to desecrate holy sites. For example, Hadrian built a temple to Zeus on the Temple Mount where the temple had previously been. He tried to desecrate the site. When he discovered where the tomb of Jesus was, there he ordered that a temple be built to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of sex. It was a total desecration of such a holy site. And that temple stood there for hundreds of years. But when Constantine came to power, he gave the order for the temple of Aphrodite to be destroyed, demolished, and removed. And when they began removing the pieces of the temple of Aphrodite, guess what? They discovered the tomb of Jesus was still there. It was still there. And what Hadrian thought would destroy it actually preserved it. It was preserved all those years. Now today, when you visit the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it doesn't look much like a tomb. That's because it's covered with all kinds of religious decorations that have been placed on it for 1,700 years. But if you remove the exterior, if you remove all the religious decor, all the decorations, underneath all of that is a first century tomb, and that is where Jesus was buried and where Jesus was resurrected, again an event, that was commemorated in the year 326. 326. They already knew the place where Jesus was buried and was raised from the dead. And today I'm going to talk to you about the empty tomb. But I want to remind you that this Sunday is Easter. This is your opportunity to take someone to church. Maybe someone who has drifted away from the Lord and they need to recommit their life. Maybe someone who has never known the Lord. Get them. Take them with you to church. Let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ so they can be born again and come under the Lordship of Jesus. Can you think of anything better to happen on Easter? You will never regret that you went out of your way 
to get somebody to a service where they could come to the Lord. Wow. And if you lack the courage to do that, let us pray with you. Call us. We'll pray with you right on the telephone. We'll pray for you to have courage, to have boldness, to have the power you need to invite somebody to church this Sunday where their lives can be transformed. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today is the last day we're offering this on the program. Order it. It's 25 parts based on these programs with a wonderful study guide. It is just wonderful. We're also offering you my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. I like what's written on the back of the book. It says, you think you know what happened, but what if you could get past all the commonly recognized pieces of the story? What else would you find? Paid in Full is a riveting account of Jesus' final hours, and it takes you on a journey. It is an amazing journey, and I want you to have this. Please go to our website, order your copy today. But today we're going to very quickly review some of the points we covered in yesterday's program. Today we're going to return to the tomb where Jesus was raised from the dead. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 28, verse 5 and 6, which we covered in the last program. But very briefly, I want to cover it again. It's so very important. The Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Remember, there was a whole group of women who came to the tomb, said, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified, he is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. There are such important things in this verse. First of all, the angel said, He is not here, for he is risen. That word risen is a Greek word, egyro, which means to rouse from death, which means for Jesus, death was just sleep. Eventually, Jesus came out of it like a man waking up from his sleep. Jesus was roused from death, truly a miraculous event. And the angel said, he's not here for he is risen. He's been roused from death. That's a literal translation. As he said, and then the angel offered an invitation to the women. The angel said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Come on in, come into the tomb. We want you to see this with your own eyes. And in fact, the angel said, see, the word see is from the Greek word hareo, which we covered in the last program. This word see means to see, to behold, to perceive, to delightfully view. It describes a scrutinizing look or to look with the intent to examine, to fully view, to experience, to know something from personal observation, not from secondhand information. So when the angel said, come and see, Here's really what it meant. We want you to behold this with your own eyes. We want you to really perceive what has taken place. We want you to delightfully view the place where Jesus once laid, but you'll see now he's not there. We want you to take a scrutinizing look. We want you to look with the intent to really examine what has taken place. We want you to experience this. We want you to know this from personal observation and not simply by secondhand information. The angel threw open the door and invited them into the tomb to see this with their own eyes. There was nothing concealed, nothing hidden. It was all there for the women to see. And the angel said, come, see the place. Very interesting in Greek, the word place is from the word topos. It describes a real place. It's the equivalent of saying, we want you to lay your hands on this place. We want you to touch it. We want you to see it, the very topos, the very place where the Lord previously was laying, previously, because he's no longer there. He's been raised from the dead. That place is now empty. And the angel wanted the women to see it all and to experience it all firsthand. And in Luke 24, verse 3, the Bible says, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus, because he had been raised from the dead. In Mark 16, verse 5, Mark tells us what happened next. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. Listen to what these words mean. First of all, when they entered into the tomb, they saw a young man standing to the right side. This was another angel. Now remember, they already confronted an enormous angel outside the tomb. It was that angel who said, come on in. Now they've entered the tomb and they confront another angel. And the Bible tells us the second angel looked like a young man. This phrase in Greek, 
describes a young man filled with vigor and energy and one who's in the prime of his life. And it illustrates the vitality, the strength, and the ever youthful appearance of angels. That's important because it tells us a lot about angels. Angels look very young and youthful. They look like robust young men. And the Bible even tells us how angels are dressed. It says clothed in a long white garment. When the Bible says clothed, it is a Greek word peribalo, which describes a garment that is thrown around the soldiers like a warrior who is wearing a uniform. And when the Bible says white, the Greek word lukas describes something that is dazzling, resplendent, beautiful. The word garment is the Greek word stole, and the word stole describes a long flowing robe normally worn by royalty, commanders, soldiers, kings, priests, and other elite individuals or those of high distinction. So when the women saw this angel, first of all, he looked very young, very robust. Secondly, he had a garment wrapped around his shoulders, and the Bible tells us what kind of garment. It was the same garment that a soldier or a warrior would wear. Now we find the full depiction of, of angels. And in Mark 16, 5, the Bible goes on to say that the women were frightened. This particular word is very, very interesting. It's not the normal word for fear, but this is the word which means to be astonished. A better translation for us would be, they were blown away. It describes a mind-boggling experience. This was beyond their imagination. This was mind-boggling. They were totally perplexed. This was astonishing. First of all, the stone had been removed. They didn't anticipate that. Second, they saw an angel so huge, it was sitting on top of the stone, almost as if the stone was a chair for the angel, it really denotes the size the stature of that massive angel. The angel invites them inside. They come inside. They see the empty place where Jesus' body used to be. Now it's gone. And there is also another angel who looks like a young, youthful warrior that is simply dazzling. And the Bible tells us they were frightened, which means their mind was blown. This was a mind-boggling experience. And in fact, their mind was so blown the Luke chapter 24, verse 4 says they were much perplexed. That word perplexed, the Greek word opereo, which describes one who loses his way. Someone so confused he can't figure out where he is, what he's doing, or what's happening around him. A person completely bewildered by surrounding events. They've just kind of lost the sense of it all. What in the world is taking place? What in the world has happened? We came here to anoint the body of Jesus, the dead body of Jesus. He's gone. There's a big angel outside. There's another angel on the inside. This is a dazzling experience. And the Bible says they became perplexed or in the midst of it all, they became confused and they lost their way. They didn't understand what was happening. Then Luke 24 verse 4 tells us what happens next. It says, Then two men stood by them in shining garments, stood by the Greek word ephistomy, which means to come upon suddenly, to take by surprise, to burst upon the scene, to unexpectedly appear. Two more angels show up. So now there's a giant angel in, outside, a warrior looking angel on the inside, and suddenly two more angels show up who burst on the scene. These women are being inundated with supernatural events. And the Bible says that these particular angels were dressed in shining garments. That word shining, the Greek word astrepto, which describes something dazzling or something that shines or flashes like lightning. The word garments describes a garment or a long flowing robe. These angels were simply beautiful. And in Luke 24, verse 5 to 8, listen to what the angels said unto them. And as they were afraid, it's referring to the women, and bowed their faces to the earth, the angels said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. That word risen, again, the Greek word egyro, which means one who's been aroused from death. Aroused from death. He is not here. He's been aroused from death. And then the angel said, Remember, how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Rise again in Greek is the word anastani, which means to stand again. 
It describes resurrection from the dead. Resurrection is stand again power. When resurrection power is working in you, if you've been knocked flat, if you feel like the life has been taken out of you, resurrection power has the power to put you on your feet again. It restores you to life. It restores everything. This, in this case, describes the power of resurrection from the dead. And then the women remembered Jesus' words. And the angel said in Mark 16, verse 7, Go your way and tell his disciples about all of this. In Mark 16, verse 8, Mark tells us, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. In Matthew 28, verse 8, the Bible says, They did run to bring his disciples' word. And in Luke chapter 24, verses 9 and 10, Luke says that they told these things unto the apostles. And then in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, Luke tells us something very funny. Now remember, Luke is a doctor. Luke never misses a beat. If there's something to include, Luke always includes it in his account. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, Luke the doctor adds something that a doctor would add. Listen to what he says. And their words, he's talking about the women who are now reporting to the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they, the apostles, believed them not. Idle tales is the Greek word leros. The word leros emphatically describes nonsense, babble, or delirium. Or Luke says when the women were telling the story to the apostles, they seemed delirious. It seemed like nonsense. It seemed like pure babble. Why? because they had mentally and emotionally lost their way. They were baffled by what they had seen. They had lost their way, the Greek word apareo. They didn't understand what they had seen, where they had been, what they had encountered. They had seen this angel and that angel and more angels. They were just mentally overwhelmed by what had taken place. And now they're trying to report it to the apostles. And Luke the doctor says, they sounded like they were delirious, like they were speaking nonsense or babble. However, what they said was effective enough that it caused Peter and John to say, we're going to get up and move from here. We're going to the tomb to see what in the world these women are talking about. And that's where we go next. And the Bible tells us in John 20, verses 3 to 4, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, that is a reference to John. Let's read it again. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, or John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple, that's John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. So Peter and John said, let's get up, let's go. We want to see what these women are talking about. Both of them are running together to get to the tomb. And John is so excited, he outruns Peter and gets there first. And they came to the sepulcher. In other words, Peter and John's feet were moving before these women were finished trying to communicate what they had experienced. They were so excited. Such a spark was ignited in their heart. They were up, their feet were moving. They were on the way to the tomb as quick as they could get there. And John outran Peter. When they heard what was happening at the tomb, they were on the move to get there as quickly as possible. Peter and John raced to see what the women were trying to communicate. What's interesting is Peter and John are the only two apostles who went. The others didn't move. They stayed at home and they missed the whole event. They missed the whole event simply because they stayed at home. Maybe they were enjoying their meal. Maybe they didn't believe the women. Maybe they just didn't want to be bothered at the moment. The other apostles stayed at home. Only Peter and John went to the tomb and had a real divine encounter. It makes me wonder how many things we miss because we don't go to church. Hmm. What in the world do you miss by staying home? If you want to experience the power of God, you've got to get up and you've got to move toward Jesus. If you just sit around and say, you're not going to budge, you're not going to move, you're too comfortable, you're probably going to miss a lot. These apostles missed a lot. Peter and John experienced something special because they got up and they moved. How about you? Are you moving toward Jesus? If you want to experience the power of Jesus Christ, you've got to get up and move in His direction. But the Bible tells us in John 20, verse 25, Peter and John ran to the garden, and the Bible says, And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. It's describing the apostle John. So John gets there first. 
Do you understand the picture? He has outrun Peter. He has arrived at the tomb before Peter. John is there first. And John stoops down and looks in. And John writes that he saw the linen clothes lying, but he didn't go in. Well, there's several important things in this verse. First of all, the Bible says stooping down. The Greek word means to peer into, to bend low, to take a closer look, to stoop down, to see something better, to look intently or to examine closely. So now John uses a word very specific to describe his activities. He's arrived at the tomb before Peter. He's bending down. He's stooping low. He's peering into the tomb, but he's not going into the tomb. And the Bible says he saw the linen clothes. The word saw from the Greek word blepo. The word blepo in this case is intended to describe something that jars you to reality. When he saw the linen clothes, he understood something significant had taken place. And by the way, linen clothes is even important because this particular word for linen clothes describes very expensive material fabricated and produced primarily in Egypt. Very expensive. In fact, this is the same kind of material that very wealthy men would use to adorn themselves or their wives. Why do I make a point of that? Because when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus, they gave Jesus their very best. They didn't bury Jesus as a beggar or as a poor man. They dressed him in the very, very best. They probably remembered Jesus' teaching. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And when they put Jesus in that tomb, when they put Jesus in the earth, they spent a lot of money in the burial. They dressed him in the finest of clothes. They invested a lot of money in the burial of their dear friend, their Lord and their master, because their heart was in Jesus. And where your heart is, that's where you put your money. It's easy to determine where your heart is. Just look where you spend your money. That's where your heart is. And when they buried Jesus, they buried him in the best. They invested a lot in Jesus because their heart was in Jesus. Now, graves were places of respect. So Jews were a little hesitant about entering into tombs. But there's something more. John may have seen Pilate's broken seals. Wow, this was very serious. He realized it looked like a crime scene. And the last thing he wanted to do is rush into a crime scene where he would be connected with something that had taken place, a violation of Pilate's seals. John may have really pondered, do I really want to go in? Do I want to risk my reputation? Do I want to risk my life by going into a place that I'm not authorized to enter? Pilate's seals meant no one was authorized to enter into the tomb. But John chapter 20, verse 6 and 7 tells us about Peter. Peter finally shows up. And the Bible says, Then cometh Simon Peter following him, who immediately went into the sepulcher. Peter didn't wait. Peter didn't pay attention. He just barged right in. And seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin, which was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. You know, every word is so important in the Bible. First of all, the Bible says that Peter saw the linen cloth, the word saw, from the Greek word theomai, which means to see, like looking at a play in a theater. Peter really observed everything that was going on inside the tomb. He looked at everything like a professional spectator. He was really examining everything. And he saw the napkin. The word napkin is a Greek word which describes the burial cloth placed on the face of a dead person. And the Bible says it was wrapped together in a place by itself. Wrapped together means to neatly fold to nicely arrange or to arrange in an orderly fashion. And I just love this. Here Jesus is being raised from the dead by the power of God, the power of God surging through his body. And when Jesus sets up, Jesus is so committed to doing things decently and in order, he takes the time to take the napkin and to nicely fold it and put it in its place. You see, Jesus has always been committed to doing things decently and in order. He's the same today. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. 
In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $17. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now or go to renner.org. As I close today's program, I want to remind you of Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It says, If the Spirit of Him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, will He not also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit? The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That is the Holy Spirit. And just like the Holy Spirit's power quickened Jesus and raised Jesus from the dead, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to do it, He will quicken your mind to think better. He will quicken your body to feel better. He'll quicken you with strength for whatever you're facing. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and if you'll let Him do it, He will quicken you supernaturally even right now. And I speak that to you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to remind you that I'm offering you today my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. And today is the last day that we're highlighting this book. Also my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. It has been so good to share these programs with you. 25 programs talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I close, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's Word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.